Okay. Okay, so um, we still have two minutes, so we're going to start. So I'm going to walk around with um, some display models. These come apart. Um, for those, so those of you who saw the shuttle fly over the Bay Area, hands who saw who saw a shuttle fly over Bay Area or DC or whatever. Okay, so these are one four hundred scale models of the 747 and Discovery, my favorite shuttle. And then this is a 1 400th um, scale model of the L-1011 Star Stargazer that Orbital uses for flying the Pegasus. It's got a little, little metal Pegasus on the bottom. I couldn't resist that. Okay, so I'll pass these around and then they'll be up here at the end. So um, remember the shuttle comes off, so try not to do a free flight unless it's under control circumstances. Do you know that an L-1011 still exists somewhere? Um, as Bob said, L-1011 still exists somewhere. I, I'm not sure who's flying them. I think they're flown a lot in the third world. I saw one at, um, uh, at Dulles when I was either heading out or coming back for the launch campaign, um, and there were no markings on it. Um, so I'm not sure how active those things are. They're really cool aircraft. They're the fastest commercial jetliner. Um, but, uh, you know, speed and fuel costs, I think, were overriding concerns. So. Yeah, and I think, you know, the DC-10s, of course, you know, are big in the FedEx fleet. So I think it's kind of like a a beta VHS thing that, you know, if, if FedEx had gone to L-1011s, maybe we'd see those puppies, um, you know, flying still today, but, okay. Um, uh, yes, sir. Thanks, sir. Good morning. We're going to get started with the conference here today. Um, so if you could please, if you're going to chatter, please go out in the hall. Thank you. Okay, so we have uh, Will Merchant, and um, he's going to talk to us about the Pegasus launch with the new star, or NASA's new star, and that's uh, the latest space telescope that NASA's been flying, and uh, as an R member, Will, Will will be uh, part of the launch crew for, to put this on an anonymous X-ray observatory. Oh, ambitious X-ray observatory. <laughs> 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 These things, you don't need them sometimes. Uh, and come here about a new star uh, for the talk here, and uh, I understand it's an exciting talk. And we'll just give a little briefing about the... I hope it's an exciting talk. It's first thing in the morning. You folks exactly. should all be juiced up on caffeine and ready to go. I and... on caffeine. I guess that's my failing point here. So okay. I... Better living through chemistry, sir. All right. All right. Thanks very much, Dave. Thank you very much. Do you need a light stick? Um, I can use this one, I think. Um, you have one? So, I'm Will Marchant. I work um, for the uh, Space Sciences Laboratory at the University of California, Berkeley, which is, um, you know, just up the bay from here. And I actually uh, live full-time in Virginia and telecommute to Berkeley. I've been doing that for, for a number of years now. And I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of this New Star mission and how we got involved in it and, uh, and the Pegasus itself. Um, my background is in uh, computer science. Uh, I did a master's degree in space studies. Um, University of North Dakota has a distance learning program, space.edu, to get a master's in uh, space studies, and they're now doing a PhD program. So if you're interested in that, space.edu. Um, I've been uh, involved in the New Star project for about six years now. You'll hear, hear some more about that. Um, space Sciences Lab also does the Stardust at Home uh, program. Anybody heard of Stardust at Home or SETI at Home? Citizen science programs where you can participate in scientific research. SETI at Home is looking for bug-eyed monsters. <clears throat> Stardust at Home is uh, uh, aerogel plates that we flew out past Jupiter to collect um, interstellar particles, and they were returned to Earth, and um, uh, citizen scientists help look for the particles in there so that those can then be extracted and studied. And so you can sign up to do that. You get bragging and naming rights for those particles. This is probably the only time we're going to fly this mission. So probably for the next 50 or 100 years, scientific papers dealing with those particles will have your, your name associated with it. Uh, we've got instruments tweets on stereo. I'm doing web page stuff for that. That's uh, two missions on opposite sides of the sun doing stereo vision to the sun. And then uh, I'm starting to ramp up on Solar Pro Plus. Now, if we have time, I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Uh, 
I fly mostly um, with Novar in Northern Virginia where TARC is, um, but I also hang out with the Tripoli uh, folks at Battle Park and sometimes with MDRA. <coughs> and uh, uh, we like all sorts of rockets, right? Micromax, MNs, whatever. Um, and we, we aren't prejudicial about what type of propulsion system to use. So the Space Sciences Lab is up on top of the Berkeley Hills looking down over the campus. Uh, just It celebrated its 50th anniversary a few years ago. And um, there are a number of staff members there who um, support the campus faculty who need to build and operate scientific research instruments to, to continue their research and also to help out with their, with their teaching activities. And so that's what I do. Um, the lab does lots of different stuff, balloons, sounding rockets. I'm mostly involved with um, orbiting satellite stuff. And uh, we talked a little bit about SETI at home and Stardust at home. And I encourage you to go check out those sites because I, I think they're fun and, and kind of exciting. Um, the new star mission is X-ray astrophysics. And so, and I'll introduce Dr. Lynn Kaminsky, who's um, a, a long-time associate at Space Sciences Lab. She's actually the lead of at Santa Rosa for the educational outreach activities for new stars. So she's a great resource. And some of her um, personnel are here as well. And they'll be talking in the next couple of talks. So ambush them if you have science-specific questions about New Star. I can talk about technical operations issues, but I'm not really a, an astrophysicist. So uh, we originally got started with New Star because it's a, it's a SMEX that's a, a relatively um, uh, uh, cheap uh, space astronomy mission. Um, the, the Explorer Program Office at Goddard Space Flight Center, which administers all these Explorer class missions, was actually run by Jim Berriman for a number of years of the Berriman equations. Okay, and he got, he got started with that to do sounding rocket stability studies, but he was also a hobbyist, and so that work carried over, and uh, we're using that uh, even to these days. And if you come to TARC, uh, Jim's often at TARC, so you'll get a chance to, to chat with him. Um, the Space Sciences Lab got involved with New Star because we have a mission operations center and we have a 10 meter um, dish that we use to control our own spacecraft. And so, and you know, we're university employees. The university is not a profit making institution, um, and we're on fixed salaries. We don't get overtime, and so we're cheap. Um, and so the idea was that that would be our contribution to the New Star mission that we would um, would operate it out of our facilities, and then we would also um, do some of the science return on the mission. Uh, so our Mission Operations Center has been around for a while. Um, and can people hear in back OK? OK. Um, so we're running a number of spacecraft right now. There's a, and sorry, you can't really see this stuff very well. Um, there's a five uh, spacecraft constellation called Themis that was um, uh, designed to measure magnetic fields and particles um, interaction with the solar wind from the sun as it comes out and bubbles around the Earth. So there were five spacecraft flying in for formations around the Earth. When that mission was done, um, the two farthest out spacecraft were sent out, and they're orbiting around the moon now um, in a, uh, a follow-on mission. Uh, this is HESI, which is a sun-staring um, X-ray astrophysics <coughs> mission. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the new star mission we're running. Uh, CINEMA is a CubeSat mission. Have, have, has everybody heard about CubeSats? Anybody need an explanation about CubeSats? Okay, so um, Bob Twiggs at Stanford University is, I think, probably the guy that you would give credit for really getting the CubeSat stuff going. The idea is that there's often um, spare capacity on launch vehicles, um, but it's very difficult to convince people to carry a, a university or high school built experiment because if it messes up, it may uh, damage the, the primary spacecraft or the launch vehicle. So Bob had a very clever idea of building a, a, a ruggedized, essentially an armored carrier that you could um, qualify to a very high level and you could bolt onto um, these launch vehicles in place of, of the ballast that you normally fly on those things. And then once the primary spacecraft um, was sent out on its mission, you could then flop the door open and you could dump out these little tiny standardized sized um, CubeSats. And so, um, that's actually really starting to take off, and there are a number of universities and some high schools that are actually flying these missions. And so Cinema is a, um, a CubeSat that some of our students built and, uh, and launched last year. 
And then uh, FAST is another mission. It's an aurora snapshot mission, so it's in a polar orbit, looking at how the auroras form and the interaction with the sun, stuff like that. So we've got a, a fairly good track record of, um, of operating spacecraft. Um, here's a picture of our mock, our mission operations center. Um, you know, in the Apollo days, you, you, know, you look at the mission control facility, and it's really cool because they have consoles and everything. And, and they have little tubes where you can send donuts to your friends and notes and, and things like that. Well, these days, of course, what you have is you have a bunch of boring-looking computers, and then uh, you know you customize them with software. So it's not nearly as cool. But um, uh, we have a you know th this entire thing is set up. It's all secure. We've we've operated a, you know about about ten missions out of there, um, and we're cheap. We have this. Uh, 10 meter, 30-foot uh, dish that we can um, use to talk the spacecraft out about as far as the moon. Um, here's a, a personnel access door down there, so that gives you a little bit of, of sense of scale. Can people see these things OK, or should we try and turn the lights out down in the front of the room? Look, pe people are happy. Maybe, Dave, could I get you to try and, and dump the lights maybe in the front a little bit? that a little bit better? OK. Um, <clears throat> there's that strange man again. Um, uh, I'm in the Mission Control Center there doing some New Star stuff. And uh, in the back is a rack of equipment that we use to control the dish. Um, not used for New Star, and I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later. So it's kind of funny how these missions evolved. You know, originally, we were going to be, you know, the idea was that our dish, which was cheap, would be the reason why we're involved in New Star, but the, the New Star orbit changed, and so we can no longer see New Star from our dish, but we're still the mission operations center for it. Um, so why are we interested in, in X-ray astrophysics? Well, um, you really you have to do this stuff from space because thankfully the Earth's atmosphere filters out a bunch of this really bad stuff. Otherwise, life on Earth would be radically different than, uh, than what it is currently. But um, all this X-ray stuff comes from very highly energetic ast astrophysical things, typically black holes or stuff that's going on in the center of galaxies. And um, uh, you, can, you can ambush Lynn later on to talk about the details of that stuff. But um, you know, basically how stars form, how stars live and die, the evolution of different types of stars, it's all fascinating um, because we need to understand stars because Earth, life on Earth is influenced, um, you know, the biggest influence on, on Earth is really the energy that comes from our sun. So um, we just have one sun. We need to look at other suns to figure out, is it typical, is it atypical, you know, how is it going to evolve? evolve? Um, how do little fluctuations in, in solar activity influence us on Earth? So astrophysics is important. You would think, you know, why spend the money on this stuff? But we need to do it because it influences us on a day, daily basis. Um, you know, our power grids, communications, things like that. Um, so a bunch of goals for New Star. Um, a district house power, black holes are distributed. Um, uh, typically, um, exploding stars um, are the things that create the, the heavier elements that, you know, the, the heavier metals and things that, um, that are essential for life on Earth. So how do stars evolve? How does this stuff um, get cr created and then distributed around um, uh, the universe? The um, early technology for um, doing X-ray or these high energy um, telescopes was actually fairly crude. And here's an example uh, on the left of the integral mission. Um, and what its view of a part of the sky would look like. And then here's a simulation of the same part of the sky of what um, you would see with New Star after, after the fact. So um, just, uh, you, can, you can just see that the quality is, um, is vastly different, and that means you can do much more different science. New Star is pretty cool in that the detector that it has not only lets you take a, a, a picture of the sky, but it also essentially is a color camera and so it tells you the, you know, the, um, the energy of the radiation that's coming in from these different positions on the sky. So um, other missions, you could kind of call them black and white cameras, where, where you would get uh, 
uh, intensity, but you wouldn't get any sort of spectral information from a spot on the sky. But uh, New Star looks out there and it actually tells you, you know, that, that this photon had a certain amount of energy coming from, from this part of the sky. So pretty exciting stuff. Um, New Star is a low cost mission or, or was a low cost mission or um, didn't have a lot of money for launching. And, um, but the interesting thing is that, is that in order to get that, that high resolution on the sky, um, you had to have um, a special type of mirror. And um, X-ray and high energy um, optics are, are quite different from uh, bathroom mirror optics where um, you know, when you have a typical mirror, you, um, you have a, a photon that comes in at a, at a high angle and it bounces off, and then you can see it. Well, if an X-ray comes in at that high angle, it'll either be absorbed, it'll just go on through. So you can't use conventional mirrors like you might use in your, in your normal Newtonian telescope. Um, you have to use mirrors that um, are more like skipping a stone off of water, where the photons come in at a very shallow angle and then they bounce off again and they aren't absorbed. And the, the disadvantage of that is that um, uh, the focal length has to be fairly long um, if you want high resolution optics. And then also if you think about the, the surface of the lake, there's not a whole lot of collecting area at that very shallow angle. And so what New Star did is they had hundreds and hundreds of layers of mirrors all um, concentrically together in, a, in an assembly about the size of a, uh, of a garbage can. And there are two of those. And they, um, they focus their light down on detectors here about um, uh, 30 feet away. Now, um, uh, we used to be able to fly fairly large telescopes, things like Hubble and stuff, on shuttle. But it's incredibly expensive. It's very difficult. And so for the New Star mission, what uh, had to happen was that the um, mirrors and the optics bench uh, had to be very close together, and as a matter of fact, tied together with them. Um, uh, with electrically activated bolts for launch. And then um, there had to be this uh, extendable mast that would then separate the optics from the, from the bench after you were on orbit so that you could get that, that focal length. Um, and this had to be um, deployed on orbit to a very precise distance, you know, to within fractions or millimeters or whatever. Um, and so it was a, a fairly complex mechanism. But all this had to unfold up. The solar arrays had to wrap around the spacecraft so that you could fit it into a, a cheap launch vehicle, which was the Pegasus in this case. Uh, who's been to the Udbar Hazi Center in Washington, D.C., Smithsonian? Okay, people whose hands are down, that's your homework assignment. You need to sometime <laughs> go to the Udbar Hazi. And um, go into the space wing there, and if you look up above the Space Shuttle Discovery, who's now living there, um, you will see this piece of hardware, which is the shuttle radar topography mission. And this was um, also, this mast was also built by um, ATK, who built the New Star mast. And it, um, it all folds up into this can, and the antenna here folds up for launch on the shuttle. And then once it was on orbit, um, the astronauts would then, you know, you open the payload bay doors, you run some motors, and this thing extends out. Well, this mast is an exact, uh, it's the exact same design as the New Star mast, except that it's um, four times uh, the size in this narrow dimension. So, homework assignment, go to Udvar Hazi, look at this piece of hardware, that's what the New Star mast looks like on orbit. And right next door to the shuttle Discovery. Uh, Discovery is my favorite shuttle, it's the only one I've actually been in on the launch pad, and so you'll hear about Discovery a lot. Um, Right next to Discovery is a Pegasus XL. And um, the XL is the same launch vehicle that was used to take uh, New Star to orbit. The Pegasus is really cool. It's, um, it's currently the only air-launched orbital booster um, in the world. It's um, all solid propellant motors, except for the attitude control system up at the top, which is um, compressed nitrogen. So there are three stages in the... Um, in the basic Pegasus, this one down here, which is winged, and then a second and a third stage. And there's an optional fourth stage, which is um, uh, uses a liquid propellant, and I'm, I'm blocking on it for the moment, um, which is optional and wasn't used for New Star. One of the things with astronomy missions is you're, you're usually very concerned with contamination because 
Um, you don't want uh, propellants to be boiling off and then condensing on your optics or your detectors or whatever. And so liquid propellant systems are, are typically bad for, um, for astronomy type missions. Um, you, you folks are rocket folks, so here's some, here's some uh, characteristics of the stages. Um, ATK builds those motors. Uh, they show up fully fueled. So working with a Pegasus is quite different from integrating on um, something like a Delta or an Atlas rocket, where you typically do all your integration activity um, away from the launch pad in a, in a controlled facility, and then only very late in the game do you then roll your, your payload out to the launch pad, and, um, and typically the launch vehicle doesn't have any propellants in it at, at that point. And then um, when it's fueled, typically there's, there's nobody on the pad. Um, Pegasus, these stages show up fully fueled, so you're talking about 40,000 pounds about of AP propellant that you're sitting next to while you're trying to do all this work. So that adds a certain um, frisson of danger when you're sitting there, you know, turning things off and on that are on this rocket. But anyway, so um, uh, this first stage is a baby Z motor. I didn't bother to calculate, you know, for the rest of the stages. I'll leave that as an exercise for the reader. And you can get all these um, specifications if you want to go to the Orbital website page. They've got a Pegasus user's guide. And um, it has all the details about the propulsion system and the performance and stuff like that. So anyway, this is a, um, you, you know, these are fairly, fairly big motors, pretty big. The whole vehicle is about 50 feet long. Uh, here's a picture of Discovery in the foreground. Um, Pegasus in the background, Nike Ajax, Air Launch Cruise Missile. Uh, Bruce McCandless in, in his uh, um, doing his spacewalk up there. So, and then that's what it looks like bolted onto the bottom of this L-1011 uh, three-engine uh, aircraft. Um, I'll pass this around again. Some of, you, some of you folks have seen it earlier. Did everybody get a chance to see a space shuttle flying around um, on delivery to, to museums? Okay, so here's a... Uh, one four hundredth scale model of 747 with which which space shuttle? Discovery. Discovery thank you. Um, on top. So this comes apart. I'll pass it around. And then, um, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, and then here's a one four hundredth scale model of an L1011 to, to so you can compare these things. And it's got a little baby Pegasus on the bottom. So I couldn't I couldn't resist that. Come on, watch this. Where did you get it from? Um, Amazon.com, of course. Everything comes from <laughs> Amazon.com. So do a Google search at Amazon for um, uh, L1011 and Pegasus, and you'll you'll come up with with all these puppies. <laughs> um, so the L1011 is really cool. It's a um, uh, it's a pretty big aircraft, um, a couple hundred feet long. Uh, it's about 50 feet tall. If you took that Pegasus and you, and you stuck it on its tail um, as, if the, you, as if it was a conventional launcher, um, it reaches up almost to the, uh, to the top of that, um, that rudder. And then um, this is about uh, 20 feet across the, uh, the cabin space. Um, I'll show you some pictures later. Oracle's basically ripped out all the guts um, of the airplane aft of first class. Um, so they left the seats up in first class for the crew of the aircraft that, um, that goes around with it. They have some mechanics, and then they've also got some, some uh, launch vehicle-specific crew um, who travel around with the aircraft. Mechanics go in case there's a problem with the aircraft at one of the staging sites. Um, but the aft of the, uh, of the uh, aircraft is pretty much empty. So um, the, the flight profile is very interesting. Um, the L-1011 takes off and uh, goes up to about 40,000 feet, and it, uh, it drops the Pegasus, um, and then what does the crew do? The crew, exactly. The crew gets away from there as fast as they possibly can. Um, um, but from the moment the, the uh, Pegasus drops, it's an, it's an autonomous <laughs> flight profile, so that, that vehicle 
uh, goes up to orbit all by itself. There is a rain safety system, so you can destroy it if it starts going berserk. And uh, the, the Kwajalein launch in the South Pacific was actually a little bit challenging because there are inhabited islands around down there. And so you have to fly a particular path to make sure that you aren't getting too close to a populated island. And so um, there is a rain safety system to try and avoid any sort of accident. The, um, uh, the rocket pitches up very steeply um, to take advantage of, of those wings on the first stage. Um, and that goes on for about a minute. Um, the fairing comes off, which is, um, uh, was actually fairly exciting because uh, Orville has been having some issues with fairings on their Taurus launch vehicles, which are derivative technology from Pegasus. And so um, there are some differences between the Tauruses and the Pegasuses, and, um, uh, and our shroud worked just fine. But, um, you know, it's always, all this stuff is exciting. It's, uh, it's 10 minutes of, of uh, pretty much terror. Um, second stage and third stage burnout. And then uh, no fourth stage, as I mentioned, for, um, uh, for New Star. Um, uh, it just goes on to orbit and then starts doing, doing its business. Here's part of a, um, uh, uh, Orbital's got a couple of nice <laughs> slides on their website that show their fleet of vehicles. And I thought this one was interesting because it shows you a comparison between the Pegasus XL over here on the far left and the Taurus XL over here. And the Taurus XL is basically a ground-launched version of the Pegasus XL. It's got a slightly larger shroud for larger payloads. Um, but basically what you're looking at is this um, solid propellant first stage is replaced in the Pegasus XL by that L1011 reusable first stage that takes the thing up to orbit. So 40,000 feet, five, 600 miles an hour, um, that's what this is buying you. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, originally, New Star was going to be in a in a fairly high inclination orbit, and um, you know, which means it was going to go north and south of the equator, and that would have meant that Berkeley would have been able to see it, so we could use our ground station. Um, one of the problems with that is that. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field is not exactly centered on the, on the Earth's uh, rotational axis. It's offset. And so um, there's a place over the South Atlantic down here called the South Atlantic Anomaly. And that's basically where the Earth's magnetic field is closest to the surface of the Earth. And the Earth's magnetic field catches um, high-energy particles from the sun, and they sort of circulate around in there. That's what causes things like auroras at, at high high and low latitudes. Um, but what it means is that when spacecraft, if they're in a high inclination orbit where it's bouncing around between the north, uh, you know, the northern and southern hemispheres, um, it'll spend more time down here in the, uh, in the South Atlantic anomaly. And that's bad for a lot of scientific missions because it increases the radiation exposure, it can age components, and it can also damage detectors. So for astronomy missions, um, you know, for, for Earth observation missions, you like polar orbits because you want to see the whole Earth as the Earth rotates under your orbit. But for astronomy missions where you're looking out, um, if, you can, if you can stay in this low inclination orbit, and here's a representation of the new star orbit, um, it'll, it'll uh, limit your exposure to the South Atlantic anomaly. Um, the disadvantages are um, if you want to try and talk to, there's, there's for instance, commercial ground stations in Hawaii, um, uh, there are ground stations up at high latitudes, um, uh, you know, a low inclination orbit and a low altitude orbit means that it's difficult for you to talk to those stations. So um, uh, New Star is currently using a, a European Space Agency um, ground station in uh, northern Kenya. It's called Malindi. And that's, um, there are a couple of antennas there. One's operated by um, uh, the Italian Space Agency. And um, another one is uh, run uh, by the University of Rome for their missions. Um, so New Star is currently, and, and those, are, those are donated services um, because the Italian scientific community uh, wants to be part of the New Star mission. So they get, that's their contribution that they bring to the table. Um, so there's a ground station here. And then we're using a couple other ground stations. We can uh, get a little bit of coverage out of Hawaii. We can get a little bit of coverage out of um, Singapore. 
um, but most of the time we're trying to use that uh, that Kenya station to talk to Newstar. All right, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the integration flow for Pegasus. Um, the telescope was built at, at Caltech, basically uh, in Pasadena, California. Caltech um, administers a Jet Propulsion Lab for NASA. Uh, and Dr. Fiona Harrison was the principal investigator for New Star, so she's the, the primary scientist uh, responsible for uh, defining the mission and, and, uh, and making sure that the uh, mission is successful. And so we basically all work for Fiona. Um, the, and so Caltech was primarily responsible for, for the uh, telescope and scientific instrument. Um, Columbia University did the optics, and then ATK in uh, Santa Barbara was contracted for that mass. That's the most of the people who were doing the scientific instrument. Orbital Sciences Corporation um, built the spacecraft bus, so the solar arrays, the batteries, the radio control system, and also the pointing system that's used to point this telescope in the sky. And then Orbital also did the launch vehicle, the Pegasus, of course. The, um, the spacecraft was built in uh, uh, the orbital facilities in Sterling, Virginia, which is near the Udvar Hazy Center, a few miles up the road. And since I live about an hour from there, the original idea was that I'd, I'd spend most of my time working at Orbital, um, being the Berkeley operations person uh, on the spacecraft side. But um, the Caltech folks wanted help developing their science instruments, so I ended up spending most of my new star time in Pasadena. And then we had Berkeley people coming out across the country to be about an hour from my house to, uh, to do the spacecraft stuff primarily. So things never work out exactly as you imagine. But, um, uh, and then what happened is the uh, telescope came out to, um, uh, to, Dull to the Dulles facility and was integrated to the spacecraft. And then all that stuff was shipped to Vandenberg Air Force Base in Southern California, which is um, just uh, north of uh, Santa Barbara. And uh, that's the Western Test Range. So for polar orbiting launches in, from the continental United States, those fly out of Vandenberg because you can fly south over the Pacific. And when you drop stages, they drop in the ocean. Uh, Western, uh, Eastern Test Range, which is Kennedy. Um, you know, if you want to fly an, an equatorial orbit and you want to drop stages, you fly them out of Kennedy, so you drop them in the ocean there and you aren't, you aren't dumping hardware on top, top of people. Um, so the Pegasus and the, uh, the spacecraft showed up at Vandenberg, and this is a facility called 1553, which is um, uh, two high bays, two assembly areas where you can um, uh, assemble explosive things like um, Pegasus. Pegasuses. Um, and I spent a lot of time there as the spacecraft operator, as the least valuable member of the operations team. Um, we wanted all the, um, the primary spacecraft operators and engineers to be at Berkeley so that when the spacecraft got on orbit, they would be at the mission control facility. But we still needed a subset of people at the launch site at Kwajalein in the South Pacific so that we could configure the spacecraft, make sure that everything was okay for launch. But then as soon as launch happened, we, didn't, we no longer had a capability for actually talking to the observatory to do anything. So it was kind of a challenge to find, you know, who, who did we want at Kwajalein who could solve problems up to launch, and then uh, we need to make sure we had enough people to start 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week uh, operations of the observatory after launch, and also um, after launch diagnostic capability on orbit. So the vast majority of the team was at Berkeley. And then there were just a handful of us that went to, to Quads for the launch campaign. Um, this is inside one of the high bays at, uh, at Vandenberg at 1553. Um, this is our Pegasus in the background. The, um, the third stage is just barely sticking into this clean tent um, where, the, uh, where the observatory is, it was... Uh, uh, bolted onto the front of the Pegasus, and this puppy is fully fueled. So, um, uh, you know, you're very careful about not having cell phones that are turned on in the room because you want to avoid RF energy. Um, you know, they're they're big AP motors, so they're not that easy to ignite. But there are other energetic things on there, like some separation mechanisms and things like that. And you'd, it'd be a bad day if you cooked off some of those things uh, while this puppy was fueled. You can't really see it back here. That little bit of white is the, uh, the case that held um, the computers that I used to control the observatory. It's basically a, a, 
a mini copy of the Mission Operations Center at Berkeley that could run completely autonomously so that if the internet connections from Quadge Lane um, back to Berkeley, which run over um, fiber optic cables uh, on, the, on the ocean floor, if those got cut by some fishing trawler or something like that, you know, we'd still be able to completely launch the mission. So we configured the observatory, did all the testing to get ready for launch. That was all completely done from Quadge. Um, so this is part of the, uh, the assembly where we're um, getting the observatory onto the, um, onto the Pegasus and then doing all the interoperability testing. So this is how things look on a normal day. Um, when the squirrels get active and they get hungry um, and they start chewing on power cables, then um, this is what it looks like in there. And those are the lights from the, uh, uh, from the control panel that's operated by the uninter uninterruptible power supplies. The, uh, the emergency lights on the walls failed, actually. The batteries all croaked. And so um, uh, this was all you saw and all you heard was lots of cussing from us as we tried to um, figure out what we wanted to do. I'm going to try and show you a little movie that shows... Um, this movie is part of the, the, there's a little bit of stuff at the beginning um, uh, about it. It starts about an hour and a half before the launch of the, uh, of the New Star rocket. But a few seconds into this video, um, they'll show some stuff on the integration of the Pegasus that took place at Vandenberg. And I thought that stuff was pretty interesting. Let me see if I can get this puppy to spool up. Um, so here's the, uh, the L-1011 at, uh, at Kwajalein. It's in the middle of the night. We wanted to launch in the night in the, um, in the Pacific. Um, the space, you know, you, you always launch towards the east because you want to take advantage of the Earth's rotational energy. Um, and uh, that's George Diller, who's one. Oh, there you go. Anyway. Um, so we, uh, we launched uh, uh, very early in the morning at Kwajalein because um, we wanted the observatory when it got up to orbital altitude and uh, when it separated from the Pegasus and started deploying its solar arrays, we wanted it to just be entering um, daytime uh, over Africa so that it would have the maximum amount of battery charging time during, um, uh, during its first orbit. So this is all the integration of the separate components as they come to Vandenberg Air Force Base and, uh, and shrouds going together. So this is the, uh, the first stage nozzle. There's a, a fairing that goes on there, um, the, the, the steerable fins. Um, there's no uh, separate attitude control system for the first stage burn. There are those three fins. They're, they have electric motors on them that are controlled by the guidance system on the Pegasus. Um, we sat through a couple of, um, of uh, live action tests with this thing where we faked the Pegasus into thinking that it had just been dropped. And so it was running those spins. Um, and the, uh, the shroud was also, it would, it would then uh, start activating the uh, attitude control system um, after uh, the second stage started firing. And that was all pretty exciting because the fins are big. They move fast. There's a lot of energy there. The attitude control system is, um, it's like, it's small arms fire, you know, in terms of volume. So you have to wear bearing protection and stuff. Um, so that was the second and the third stage. Here's the wing. Uh, that clean room is up here, and the observatory goes on to the front end. Uh, here are fins before they've been attached to the Pegasus. These are all composite, uh, composite wings and composite fins. Um, normally, you don't find any of these components um, after a launch, but um, after the New Star launch, the complete entire first stage actually washed up on a beach in one of the islands in the South Pacific. And um, Orbital got some frantic phone calls from the natives thinking that there was some, you know, some dangerous hardware there on the beach. So uh, uh, part of the, the team had to fly back out there, um, take a harrowing fishing boat trip to get through the breakers and land on this, you know, deserted island to check out the hardware that they knew was, you know, had all the expendables all uh, um, expended on it. So... This is the, um, 
the truck that there's a there's a trailer that you assemble the Pegasus on, and then it stays on there until it's trucked out to the uh, to the hot pad um, uh, next to the runway over at the um, on Vandenberg. And the hot pad is where aircraft are kept that have um, potentially dangerous stuff on them. So armed aircraft, you know, with missiles or whatever, those are stored on hot pads. And the L-1011, um, when the Pegasus is on it, is, is stored at the hot pad. So that if there is an issue, it's pointed in a safe direction. And, uh, um, you know, you basically have two to three minutes to get out of the aircraft in the case of a fire starting. Um, but uh, you want to make sure that Oh, so here, here's the front end of the observatory. Um, these are the, uh, the mirrors covered uh, with uh, protective covers while the, the fairing is getting put on. And so you, go, you, you try and keep things clean, you know, because um, you want to avoid as much contamination as possible on those optics. It'll all reduce the, the quality of the science that you get. Contamination is inevitable, but you, you do what you can. And then they take the, um, the rudder off for, um, for the transport out to the hot pad. And um, I've never really understood that. I think it's a clearance issue. They, they have to put the L-1011 up on jacks. Um, if you remember, like, on, on the X-1 um, uh, rocket, you know, they, they had a well that you'd drive down into, and then the, the B-29 would come over it. But what they do is they'll, they'll jack the L-1011 up, and then... Um, uh, they roll the, the carrier, the transporter up underneath that, um, put the fin back on again. There's a well that's been created up into the, the bottom of the L-1011 to hold that, um, that rudder. And then they, um, they lower the, uh, the L-1011 back down on top and, and hook up the, um, there you can see the jacks. Okay, and there's, there's the Pegasus on there. Why not a well? Is it just easier to jack it? Why not a well? Is it easier to jack it? I don't know. I, I assume that the, that the idea was that, um, you know, that you wanted to minimize the changes to the commercial aircraft. And uh, So, well, the bottom line is I don't know. Um, you know, it's an Air Force facility. They, they probably didn't want to have to have a special infrastructure at one particular place for doing this stuff. I don't know. They'll fly Pegasus out of Kennedy. They'll fly them out of, um, out of uh, uh, Vandenberg, and then they'll do them from another, about another number of other facilities. Okay, so that's that video. Um, uh, there's harness that goes from the Pegasus in the bottom of the aircraft that comes up so, you, so that you can talk to the observatory and configure it. You can't run the radio systems while the shrouds are on the aircraft because you're worried about damaging um, the, the transmitters. You're also worried about cooking other components or setting off um, uh, you know, energetics uh, on the launch vehicle. And so you have to talk to the observatory through, um, through harnesses. As a matter of fact, the transmitters are disabled. There are, uh, if you went on the Nike missile tour yesterday, um, you saw that there were a number of safing plugs that have to be put into the vehicle before you can actually fly it and then expect the bombs to work. Um, so we do the same thing on, um, on, on these other launches. You know, it'd be quite embarrassing if you were to try and deploy the solar panel while the shrouds were on um, or turn on the transmitters, some, some stuff like that that uh, that would be really quite bad. So, um, so there are enable plugs to prevent that stuff, and, and remember that because there's a story about that later. Um, so we had to load all this uh, equipment up into the L-1011. Um, Vandenberg isn't a isn't a commercial facility, so there are no jetways or things like that. There are there are stairways you can climb up, and uh, the equipment racks that we needed to run the uh, the spacecraft weighed a few hundred pounds each, and so you couldn't really just pump those up the stairs. So we got a very frightening um, forklift um, that lifted those puppies up to one of the, one of the passenger doors, and then a bunch of beefy folks picked those things up to lift them over the first class seats to get them 
uh, into the back of the aircraft where we could set them up to, um, to operate the observatory. So I don't know how well you can see this, but, um, but we're sitting at Vandenberg, and it's about 50 degrees out there on a hot pad, and we were cold. We were basically wearing all of the clothing that we had for this trip um, on that Vandenberg morning, and we were still shivering. The um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so all this stuff stays on board the aircraft. It all goes, it all goes aft, and it all gets covered up with cargo nets because um, uh, getting out to Kwajalein is actually fairly difficult. There, um, uh, there's one aircraft flight that um, starts in Honolulu, and on one day it island hops to Guam, and then the next day it turns around and it comes back again. So that's your chance to get back to Honolulu is on the following day, and, it, and so. There's that trip um, three times a week, and then on the seventh day, there are no flights. Um, so if you need stuff on quads, they have stores. There's a lot of stuff. But if you need special things, um, you bring them with you, basically. But uh, So the Orbital folks brought all these um, uh, garden chairs and stuff for us to use. Um, and here's a picture of getting the quadrilene. Sorry about that. Um, so we started in Vandenberg. Um, Kwajalein is actually kind of interesting. It's, um, it's the Reagan Ballistic Missile Test Facility, and um, it's used as a target for launching ICBMs from Vandenberg. Um, every year, every couple of years, uh, a missile crew um, gets selected. They'll pull a missile out of a silo, put a dummy warhead on it, they'll load it in a silo at Vandenberg, and then they'll fire it um, down to the instrumented range in Kwajalein to make sure that it performs. And the, the uh, Air Force crews get a chance to fire a missile, and then you also get a chance to see if missiles are storing well in their silos and if they're ready to, to perform their mission. Um, but anyway, so um, uh, we had to fly from, uh, from uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base in Southern California to Hawaii, um, and uh, we stayed overnight there um, and had crew rest, and then the next day flew down to Kwajalein. So, we went from 50 degrees here to 95 degrees in Kwajalein, and, um, which is pretty much in the middle of nowhere. Um, you're basically north of New Zealand and about 8 degrees north of the equator. So you're pretty much equidistant from anything, uh, I'll say interesting, that's, kind of, that's a little bit cruel. Um, because of the commercial flight, um, issues. We had a number of people who couldn't fit on the L-1011 and yet needed to be on Kwajalein to um, service the observatory as soon as we landed. And so the easiest way to do that, the cheapest way to do that, is to um, charter a commercial jetliner. There's this company called Miami Air that um, flies um, the things, you know, baseball teams and basketball teams around. You know, you can you can charter them to take big groups of people around. NASA's used them before. And um, uh, so we, uh, we had an airplane all to ourselves. Um, this was actually the day of the transit of Venus. And uh, we landed in Honolulu about halfway through the transit. And um, I wish I'd gotten a shot of it. I brought a whole bunch of little disposable um, solar observing glasses and stuff. So we had a bunch of people out on the ramp looking at the transit of Venus. And the weather was actually really good for that. Um, the Kwajalein Atoll is kind of an interesting place. It's, um, it's got a huge sort of geographic area if you draw lines in between all the islands. Um, you know, but the total real estate, you know, sand you can actually walk on is fairly, is fairly small. It's about like the size of Washington, D.C. And here's a picture of Quaj from the air. This is looking north. Um, so you can see that a lot of the island is actually taken up by this runway. Um, the hot pad is down here for um, uh, where the L-1011 or any other um, you know, explosives bearing aircraft is. Um, there's petroleum and fuel storage. Um, this is sort of a, a depot for the Pacific area. And then um, living quarters and schools and things like that are up here. Uh, and then this is the airport terminal facilities. Um, and you can see the rest of the atoll sort of sort of goes up here. Um, the ICBMs um, come in, and if you want to recover the, the nose cone, it goes into the uh, uh, 
lagoon where it's fairly shallow. If you don't want it back, then you, um, you dump it uh, uh, out in the, in the deep ocean. There's a lot of stuff in here left over from, uh, from World War II. Uh, the German battleship, the Prince Eugen, which was captured and was loaded up with food and, and uh, fuel and torpedoes and stuff and used as part of the nuclear tests, um, was, was towed here and it actually sank. Um, and uh, and uh, inverted um, up in the islands here, so it's a very popular scuba um, uh, destination. And there are lots of um, aircraft and ships and stuff like like that, um, uh, both as as a dumping ground, um, but also from the <coughs> fierce battles that were fought um, on the island during World War II. So lots of unexploded munitions. If you go scuba diving, I, I only got to do one dive there, um, but you know the the rule is. Don't touch it because. <laughs> um, there are other hazards um, uh, on the island, and um, I, I didn't have to worry about that. They don't make you wear a helmet. but um, And then um, probably the biggest hazard is, um, is the food. There's cafeteria on base, um, but it's mostly deep fried vegetables and things. And I tried eating it a couple times. And um, so the. There's a Burger King, and there's a Subway, and there's a Papa John's Pizza, and there's a Baskin Robbins ice cream thing in this little tiny area. They're all serviced by the same person, so there's a little bell on the counter, and um, you bang the bell, and, and the person walks around and then you know puts on their different face for the different fast food. Um, so the bottom line is when you're at Vandenberg for a month getting ready to, to go out to Quadge, um, you don't eat at Burger King. You don't eat at Subway, and you don't eat at Papa John's, you don't eat at Baskin Robbins because you're going to get your fill when you're on the island. Um, here's a little picture from the residential area looking, um, looking towards the south. Lots of palm trees, uh, water supply, um, and this is sort of the, uh, the office area. Uh, World War II landing craft are used to ferry from uh, Ebai, which is the next island over where most of the population lives. A lot of the Marshallese um, uh, commute onto the island to, um, uh, to do maintenance and work in the retail stores and, and things like that. Um, this used to be a U.S. protectorate until, I think, um, the mid-'80s, at which point the Marshallese decided they wanted to be um, independent. And now it's the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and um, Kwajalein is rented um, from the Marshallese. Um, more residential areas. Um, some of the leftover stuff from World War II. Um, here's a little video. Um, this will show the, um, the L-1011 coming in. So um, lots of tracking assets, um, optical, radio, lots of radar units. Um, Nav Spacer is putting the newest um, radar space fence down there um, to track orbital stuff. Um, the runway is a little bit tight for the L-1011. Um, the guy who's the pilot of this is Bill Weaver. And if you do a Google on Bill Weaver and um, SR-71 breakup, he's the only guy who's ever survived an in-flight um, Mach 3 breakup of an SR-71. He was a test pilot for that. Um, but he um, and the rest of his crew are now retired. They run a company where they do L-1011 stuff, and they, are, they do all the piloting operations for, for orbital on the L-1011. So these guys literally wrote the book on flying the L-1011, and they make all this stuff look easy. They're, they're really the folks with the right stuff. Um, and here we're getting backed up onto the hot pad, which was literally the hot pad. Um, uh, there was no air conditioning in the, um, uh, in the cabin of the uh, L-1011 because you have to run the APUs um, to get air conditioning from the aircraft. And we didn't want to spend the fuel or burn the time on the APUs. So we were in there dripping sweat at like 95 degrees and 95% humidity. Um, we did have air conditioning in, down in the shroud um, to try and keep the observatory cool. We were worried about the epoxy 
that holds the mirrors together. We didn't want that to get too hot because we didn't want the mirrors to deform. Um, so we did a lot of our testing work at night um, to try and keep the temperatures down. And then it got into the balmy 80s, and, um, and you could pop out of the cabin a little bit, and there was usually a nice breeze. But um, it was kind of brutal. You know, you'd start, you'd start the day with, um, with boxes of bottled water about this big, and you'd be done with those at the end of the day. Um, L1011 hot pad again, very hot pad. Uh, here's a picture of us. Um, you can notice the, the change from Vandenberg where it was like three layers of clothing to um, like almost zero layers of clothing. I think you know, we had, Chris was, you know, he would have run around in, in his all together if, um, if possible. But um, here's the, uh, uh, here's the Mission Operations Center uh, computer that I was responsible for operating. And we did have some, uh, some air conditioning. Oh, there's, there's another picture. So here's the, here's the uh, in contrast to the Vandenberg with, with Harry's uh, sweaty back and, and Will's um, bright red Dumbo ears frantically trying to shed, shed heat, radiate heat. Uh, we did forklift up a big air conditioning unit. Um, this was even more frightening to get up there. It weighed about 500 pounds. Um, so putting that on a forklift, lifting it up 30 feet to try and get it through that passenger door was really scary. Um, but nobody was killed. Um, and it actually helped a little bit. We ducked, ducked some of that air back to, the, uh, to, the mission control, to my mission control facility. And um, people were actually pretty enthusiastic that they thought um, everything was going to work. This is an interesting shot because um, uh, I'm standing just aft of the first class cabin, which is where the seats are and all the racks are that run the Pegasus during launch. And then um, we're looking aft, and that's the aft pressure bulkhead um, for the main crew cabin in this L-1011. So this is basically the size of, um, uh, you know, width of a couple or maybe three bowling alley lanes and probably... Um, uh, going back uh, farther than a bowling alley. Uh, we did most of our stuff at night. That's a, that's a full moon. That's not the sun. And we saw lots of uh, sunrises. And Harry got out a little bit to meet some friends. Um, and we had some visitors on the hot pad. I don't know how this crab got out there, but um, he took residence underneath the spacecraft. He really liked it. Uh, there was a chance for one barbecue that the orbital folks um, flew over from California. They have a favorite barbecue place, so they brought food over for a, a pre-flight um, celebration. And then on the day of launch, the last thing you do is you put those enable plugs in because um, it would be even more embarrassing to fly and not have that stuff be enabled on orbit. So there's an obligatory um, photo you're supposed to take that you email to NASA so that they can verify that you put those enable plugs in. So <clears throat> this was the first photo that we sent to the NASA guys saying that we put the enable plugs in. So, you know, um, the solar sensors were enabled and the radio system was enabled and the batteries were enabled. Um, and we never heard back from the NASA guys about that. We sent them the, the real photos about five minutes later, but there was never any comment about that. So I think they were, they were upset. <laughs> um, the obligatory photo with my space, space cat t-shirt in front of the Pegasus ready to launch. What's the box? The box is a, um, is a clean room. It's a portable clean tent um, because there are, um, there are panels you have to get to to like, put the enable plugs in and stuff like that. So you wrap this thing in a, in a controlled environment and then you can put those panels on. Um, that's a generic takeoff. It was a night launch, so you really couldn't see anything. You could just see a little tiny bit of the vehicle um, when it dropped off, and then the video instantly flooded as soon as, um, as, soon as the first stage lit. And then there's the L-1011 um, Sands Pegasus heading off into the, uh, into the west, um, heading home after a mission. And I basically run out of time now. I was going to show you a little, um, well, let me... I'll just start this up, and then I can take like maybe one question, if somebody has a question. This is an animation of what the uh, uh, solar panel and the, um, the mass deployment looks like on orbit.
and I'll be around the rest of the day. So if you see me and you have questions, just ask. Sorry. Yes. Sir. What's the cost compared to the previous? What was the other one called? It was um, the same vehicle, but it was ground launched. Oh, what's the cost comparison of the Pegasus to the Taurus? I don't know the answer to that, actually. The Pegasus is supposed to be around, I've heard, 15 million bandied about. Um, deltas are, um, are usually 50, 60, 70 million dollars launch. I'm not sure what the, what the Taurus um, you know, launch cost is, but it's probably analogous to a Pegasus. Okay, and then I urge you to stick around for the next talk because Dr. Kaminsky and the rest of her team and some collaborators are going to be talking about Arliss, and then um, uh, they'll be talking about um, some, some other stuff. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, folks.